What's going on everyone and welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more insightful discussions, intriguing interviews and thought-provoking podcasts. Today we're diving into the profound and often complex world of religious martyrdom. With us is a leading academic in the field, the author of the fascinating book, Constructing Religious Martyrdom, John Sobosley. In this podcast, we're going on a journey through the complexities of martyrdom with John Sobosley to the contrast between Judeo-Christian and non-Abrahamic interpretations of martyrdom. We're diving into historical events the concept of Shahidi and even a Sikh homeland in East Africa. Get ready to explore martyrdom's motivations, the evolution of martyrdom within the Sikh tradition, and John's unique insights from his research, including what he'd ask the soldiers he studied if given the chance. Stay tuned to find out how the YMCA almost invoked a rebellion within the ranks of the British Indian Army, and be sure not to miss this deep dive into a subject that is both historically rich and vitally relevant in our world today. So get comfortable, grab a cup of coffee or whatever your go-to drink is and join us for this enlightening journey into the world of martyrdom with John Sibosley. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to take part. And yes, my name's John Sibosley. Uh, I am uh, an assistant professor of religious studies uh, at Montclair State University, which is in New Jersey in the US, just outside of New York. And yes, we we're saying uh, my second name, Sibosley, is a Hungarian name, uh, originally pronounced Sabaslai. And when my grandparents emigrated to the U.S., they changed the pronunciation to supposedly, feeling that it was more American sounding. And since then, I've had to correct everyone because almost everyone defaults to Sabasly, which would have been the original the original name. Um, I'll also say that someone uh, there's a a football player for Arsenal that's also named Sabosly. He includes the old Z's, so I'm getting famous, and that's what I'm really excited. About. Oh, wow. I, if you don't mind me asking, why did your family immigrate from Hungary over to America and when? Uh, it was a little before World War II. And they were, uh, and it, it's interesting because I have family from Hungary, uh, from Poland, uh, and Italy, as well as Greece. And most of them emigrated at the same time because they were concerned about the more radical politics that were happening. And they were part of communities that were being marginalized and uh, were at least at some risk. And they felt that leaving before the outbreak of hostilities uh, served them. And we were really fortunate that it did. Um, it's really interesting to find out how people end up all over the world. Um, so you never yeah. would have imagined, like I've had people on here before who have spoken about how they've, like their ancestries and c comes from Burma. And like on yeah. paper, you'd assume they're just like a Punjabi Sikh type person. But um, yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Globalized identities. It's a new world out there. It's it's nuts. It's nuts. Just then kind of before we dive into your book, do you mind just giving us an idea of kind of how you ended up in um, in the position that you're in at the university? And also kind of how did you end up with an interest in not just religion, but kind of Sikhs in particular? Sure. Um, so as an undergrad, I studied philosophy. That was kind of my intro into religion. And I did more and more religious philosophy. I was not someone that was raised in any particular religious tradition. Uh, my parents would tell me they wanted me to pick my own religion. Uh, and I always joked that that meant it was an even playing field. Uh, and thinking more about that and learning about philosophy just drew me into questions of religion. I started realizing how power structures and political structures shaped religious identities. And that was something I had never considered before. So in my postgraduate degrees, I, I kind of kept researching that. And when I got to the University of California at Santa Barbara, where I did my PhD, uh, I, I started working more in religious violence, the field of religious violence. How do religions become violent? and carved out a niche for myself in martyrdom studies, uh, particularly around self-sacrifice. Why do people sacrifice their own lives? How is this celebrated? And I was fortunate that uh, the advisor for my PhD was a man named uh, Mark Jurgensmeyer, who's uh, well known in the field of religious studies and also someone that was a salient figure in the founding of Sikh studies in uh, the American Academy. So working with him, you know, he, he did some work on um, the you know, the Golden Temple Massacre in, in 1984 and Operation Blue Star. Uh, so I was aware of uh, Sikhism and the kind of a little bit of the history. And when I was writing my dissertation, I wrote it on uh, my dissertation, which is becoming the book, is a comparative study of martyrdom. So I look at second century Christianity. I look at Shia Islam in the 1980s, particularly around Hezbollah and the Iranian Revolution, as well as uh, Tibetan self-immolators of uh, Buddhists in Tibet who have been burning themselves alive since 2011, uh, and they're ongoing. The most recent one was just last year. 
And I tried to kind of understand, like, what's going on? Why are all these things happening? And when I got the job in New Jersey, I had the opportunity to do a little more research and expand the project. And I wanted to include a fourth case. And I'd always been so fascinated by Sikhism. It wasn't something that I was very familiar with. And so having that time, I was able to dive in and it resulted in doing some uh, archival research at the British Library, at the Indian Office of Records. And just using that, I just I kept being more fascinated and more drawn into this interesting, you know, spiritual tradition that at the same time has these important political structures and these in these political movements that have helped shape life on you know both sides of the pond, both in, in North America as well as uh, England, as well as in the Indian subcontinent. So it was a bit of a winding road, um, but really driven by my interest in this apparently consistent ideal for humans to offer their lives for something, to take this you know ultimate sacrifice and be celebrated. And I just wanted to understand that in as many places in hopes that I can better understand what makes us human and what kind of unites us all together in this, uh, in this particular way. I have a million questions to ask you, but what, <laughs> one of them that's right at the forefront is what was it like be, um, kind of doing your studies under Jurgen's wire? Because I've, as soon as you said his name, all of the books that I've, I've read or kind of skimmed <laughs> through with his name on it kind of came flashing through to, to the front of my mind. Um, what was that like? That must have been quite uh, an enjoyable experience, but also I imagine quite um, like mentally f kind of task taxing as well, because I guess yeah, he, yeah. he's not going to kind of let you sit still for very long, is he? He did not. Uh, he wasn't uh, he wasn't a micromanager, which I was really grateful for. But he's such a huge name. I mean, he's you know, he, he's someone that defined the field of religious violence. And so trying to take up those those reins was extremely intimidating. But, uh, you know, I have to say that Mark is a very generous person. He's a very kind person. And he's very much someone that's willing to not only support the ideas that I was advancing, but challenge them in really productive ways. Uh, you know, we actually co-wrote a book together uh, along with uh, Dina Grego called uh, God and the Tumult of the Global Square. It came out uh, back in 2015 with uh, UC Press. And working on that book, I worked for his uh, center for many years. I put on a conference of global studies for him. You know, I taught for him. Uh, so I've been fortunate enough to get to know him. And there was, even to this moment, there's this sense that when I contact him, it's, you know, the sun just shines on you. Like, okay, I hope you appreciate these things. I hope, you know, you can, uh, you can like what I'm doing. But in general, it was really fantastic. Okay, so actually coming back to the chapter then, um, what, are the origins of the martyrdom tradition within the Sikh faith? Obviously, historically, we can we, we can pinpoint it to Guru Arjan Devji's initial Shahidi, but kind of where does the philosophy evolve from? Um, and then how does that evolve over time? Yeah, it's it's a you know to really trace the development of martyrdom tradition uh, in pretty much any any religious tradition. You can always kind of take a further step back. You know, I mean, yes, it certainly begins with uh, the gurus who in the Guru Granth Sahib are, include a lot of passages that are often thought to be supportive of martyrdom, be a sacrifice to the Guru, you know, lay down your life on the battlefield. All of these things kind of continually come into play. And um, the Dasan Granth as well has some passages that scripturally support the idea of martyrdom. If we're looking for the real genesis, we have to kind of go back before the 15th uh, and 16th century and look at the development of martyrdom discourse in Islam, which is largely where um, the, the concept derives in uh, Sikhism, but of course takes some, you know, really different turns. And this is coming from someone, you know, I've been studying martyrdom for 15 years or so now. Uh, and I always think it's important because my work really tries to capture what is this idea? You know, we throw around the terms and even, you know, Shahidi or Shahid or Marchus, which is the Greek word, you know, where do all these things come from? And, and the way I approach it is the original Greek term Martus actually meant a witness in a courtroom. Like that's what it actually meant. It meant witness, but it's literally someone that would go and give testimony in a court. And I've tried to recapture that by thinking about the ways that someone who's claimed as a martyr is seen to have used their death in support of some system of thought. Like their death actually serves as evidence and people can point to it and say, see, this is how important it is. And I think that is also taken up uh, in the seat varieties of martyrdom. It's embraced from a Shahid within Islam, but it starts to take on a few specific, um, not necessarily uh, unique aspects, but particular to the uh, to the Sikh context. 
not only do you have these scriptural uh, sentiments that encourage martyrdom, but of course you also have the martyrdoms of the gurus themselves, from you know, Jahangir and then later you know Aurangzeb. The Sikh gurus who are being martyred continue to place not only an importance on martyrdom. Some have even said that uh, martyrs, you know, are kind of raised to this new level, like just below the gurus themselves. That's how important it is. And martyr tradition has flooded Sikh traditions across the world. There's calendars, the names of schools are based on martyrs. It's really, you know, it's really, in fact, and that's common with Christianity. That's common with Islam. That's even common with uh, Buddhism in the, in the modern period. But when you have these salient figures, the most important figures within the tradition, dying seemingly in certain ways that are embraced by the majority, and this is always where it gets difficult because martyrs cannot create themselves. Martyrs are created by an audience that embraces them as a martyr. They say that person's a martyr. You can try to die a death that looks like other martyrs, but it's only when a group says, no, we accept that we embrace that person. That person is standing for something that we stand for as well, that we get this tradition. And I think that's where the uh, stories of the guru's deaths uh, you know, under the Mughal empire come into play. And it's also what helps develop the idea of Khalsa Sikhism, you know, the uh, the, the militarized Sikhism that uh, Guru Gobind Singh kind of inaugurates, that always has this concept of offering one's life for the good. And it's really how that good is defined, where we, we move on to questions of injustice or righteousness and, and the need to give kind of a whole measure of, of devotion. So I think that's, you know, and the specifics, of course, we can talk more about, but I think that's the general trend. And, and I'd also say that it's a trend that I've seen in other uh, religious traditions as well. And very similar is happening. Just just off the back of what you were saying. So I think what's interesting is, and th th there are parallels to a conversation I just had recently with another academic uh, called Daniel Elam. And we were talking about Bhagat Singh and his philosophy. And obviously... Bhagat Singh is hung and technically within the Sikh tradition he's also considered a martyr, right? And so we were talking about the philosophy of she of of or how Bhagat Singh philosophized his Shahidi in that sense. In terms of for him it was just an act and there's no reward, there's no heaven, there's no nothing. There's it's just the act of death, full stop. And in some ways I think that's very similar to what I would interpret the Shahidi tradition within the Sikh set up to be as well. But I think what's interesting when you mentioned the witness is, and also the passages within like the Guru Granth Sahib and the Dasam Granth, is, is that a lot of people would also say that that's also discussing the true death, which is your death of your ego and witnessing the divine that is then experiential at that point because your ego is not there, right? Um, so I guess what I'm actually trying to ask is, like how does it how would like how do, like how far would you i guess agree with that but also like how would you differentiate i guess seek martyrdom from a martyrdom that comes from a judo christian or abrahamic background because obviously there are there are kind of reward systems that exist there that don't necessarily um exist kind of in 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 the Sikh setup or even in the Buddhist setup but I guess you could counter argue that there's still an element of karma and things like that that may still factor in so yeah I I, I will leave the open-handed question to you there <laughs> I'll tell you Mar, you not only ask the absolute right question but you also gave the absolute right answer I mean yes there are uh, so in the Sikh tradition there's a concept of um and I, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right I'm someone that just you know that I read off in a lot of anglicized versions but uh how am I is usually how I yeah, one minute. The yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean. yeah. So that distinction is something that's overcome in martyrdom, according to a lot of the scriptural sources. Your question, and let me see if I can rephrase it in a way that I've addressed it in my own work. If, for instance, uh, Christian martyrs die so they could achieve heaven, or uh, Muslim martyrs martyred themselves so they could achieve heaven. That's a different system if you don't have concepts of heaven. Like in Buddhism, uh, depending on, you know, the interpretation of Sikhism or how we want to articulate heaven or what comes after, you know, all of those are, are, are tricky and, and very diverse in their understandings. But they are all focused on what are the benefits for the individual who martyrs themselves. Here's why I think this is such an important question and an important problem to overcome. I approach martyrdom from a very communal and a social aspect. When I said that, you know, a community embraces a martyr, 
if someone said, uh, I'm going to go out and martyr myself and they caused their own death and everyone else in the world said that was stupid. I don't think that's right. I don't appreciate that. I don't agree with it. That person's not a martyr. They just died. Maybe they thought they were going to be a martyr, but they're not remembered as a martyr. That remembrance, that um, active kind of embrace of a death as supporting something is essential. What we see when people say, oh, they just died so they could go to heaven, they just died so they could get good karma, which is something that you see uh, often in uh, some Buddhist discourses opposing the, act uh, the action of martyr, is that says it's not a communal aspect. That person is not using their death for the betterment of the community. That person is using the death for the benefit of themselves, of their next life. So it becomes a selfish act rather than a communal act. And that's what I think is essential to realize. We would even see uh, groups that opposed uh, martyrs say they just did that for themselves. If it's just a wager, if you're just going to die because this gets you the grand you know, consequences, the great reward, that's not a virtuous act. We still think of virtue as against inclination, in line with duty against inclination, which is you know an old enlightenment trope. So I do think that even if martyrdom is often articulated within these larger post-death structures, the conception of martyrdom as it is employed on the ground is much more about the community. This person is embraced because they did something for us, not just something uh, for them. Obviously, we, we're going to end up kind of with how the concept of martyrdom works within the British Empire. And I think one thing that happens between um, kind of the times of the gurus and when the British turn up is, is that there's a change in in kind of logic from an identity that's based in a, a local or regional ethno-linguistic geography. And again, kind of taking verbatim from your work here to a more kind of sacred Sikh identity. And again, anyone who's... Uh, studied the Singh Sabha and the Reformation that takes place, whether you agree with it or not, it's very clear that there was a change in logic. And obviously the concept of martyrdom, I would assume, would have been mutated or evolved during that period as well. Um, what kind of happens to it and how is it reimagined, I guess, or how is it employed within a way that is beneficial to those in power, perhaps is probably the better question. Um, and I guess that also kind of works off people like Kate Imey's work, uh, Faithful Fighters, and how kind of Sikhs are being enlisted or are being focused on in particular. Um, so, yeah, kind of what is going on at that point? Yeah, it's a, it's you know it's a it's a story of a few hundred years, uh, you know, between the death of the final human guru and the kind of imposition of the British Raj, and it's a really important period, and it's one that's also heavily militarized and really influenced by military operations on on both sides of, uh, you know, the kind of Sikh and then British uh, of forces. The idea of Sikhism as a, a, a discrete community that we can draw kind of a border and a boundary around isn't something that always existed in these ways. You know, there's there's a lot of discussion that in the 18th century, Sikhism was, you know, one kind of spiritual tradition, one guru tradition among many. And throughout the 18th and 19th and even early 20th century, there's a debate that's going on. What's the relationship of Sikhism to Hinduism? What's the relationship of, uh, you know, Amrit Dari or Khalsa Sikhism to the other varieties that are out there? And you know, when we started, I told you that some of my interests derived from how political structures play a role in shaping religious identities. And this is one of those places that it was, you know, a really salient uh, condition. The Indian subcontinent is just, it's this tapestry of, of various languages and identities and cultures and, and, and sacred traditions. When the British start infiltrating into the area, when they start creating these more strident mechanisms of governance. You know, it starts with the East India Trading Company and, and they mostly want money, but then they really want to make sure that they're exploiting as much as possible. And the militarization that comes along with that starts to develop a sense of us versus them. And I think martyrdom really plays a role in this, which is something that I'll, I'll come back to. As the uh, East India Trading Company is trying to gain more land, particularly in Punjab, they're finding resistance, particularly, uh, you know, um, uh, well, uh, Banda Bahadur, you know, his, the, the Sikh army is this fighting force that's much smaller than the forces the East India Trading Company was able to marshal. But they're able to make these, these resistances that really surprise the British. Over time, because of that, 
and because of the uh, you know the the Sikh state under Ranjit Singh and and the ability of uh, of Sikhs to start guiding their own life within this shifting world, this colonizing world, more and more there's a sense that Sikhs are are something unique. There's something separate, not separate as as alienated from the rest, but worthy of special attention. And that's really where the British Raj comes into play because colonizers best rule when they divide and conquer. You know, they rule through difference. We want to establish difference because if I can tell this group they're different from that group, I can aim them towards each other and they stop looking at me, the colonizers. So they employed that with the Sikhs and they did so in this effective, I definitely don't want to say good, but I do want to say effective way where it was um, complementary this group it's amazing what you're able to do you're such you know virtuous fighters you resisted against these odds we should recognize that we should embrace that and after the uh the you know sikh army loses and the british raj kind of takes over sikhs are immediately sought after as uh, police agents they're they're people who can defend because they've proven their valor on the field of battle and that's one more step where all of a sudden this Sikh identity starts to become something discreet from the rest of the traditions. Now, you know, you mentioned the, the Singh Sabas, and um, that's one more process by which Sikh identity is being centralized. It's being kind of, there's a centrifugal force. This is, okay, we're something new. And if the British, who are now the ruling, you know, governors of our land are treating us differently, well, then we should be able to have a little more say in what we're doing. The proselytization that the Christians are doing in this area, or the, you know, the the Hinduization of the, you know, the Arya Samaj, and they're, they're trying to embrace Sikhism as a part of Hinduism, which would take away from the identity that had been developed over time. There's all of these things that are happening, and, and to bring it back around to martyrdom, martyrdom is extraordinarily effective in drawing social boundaries. The people who embrace the martyr as a martyr become one group. The people who reject it become the out. It happens every time I, I research martyrdom. We see this exact same dynamic happen. So now you have this group that was once part and still is part of you know a broad swath. You know this uh, this kind of beautiful artistic creation of these cultures that's being pulled out and pulling themselves out as something distinct, encouraged by this new colonizing power. Who, uh, I mean, the, they had the, the ability to determine what would happen in these places. So there's a benefit that comes from it. Now you have this group that's supported because of their military uh, might and their military prowess. Well, military requires sacrifice. There's already a burgeoning idea of martyrdom within Sikhism that's becoming more and more about martial death. It wasn't always, and there's still ideas of uh, you know Sikh martyrs as um, you know as, as the bridegrooms, as, as you know, this kind of embrace of a spiritual tradition outside of everything else. But because you have Sing Sikh is becoming dominant because the British wanted to foment that. They wanted to promote that because it served their purposes. Sikhs are in their army. They want to continue this process. More and more, there's just these little pieces that come together. Um, and it's almost like a tornado that's just picking up these bits from the outside and just spiraling into something new and something different. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. That's just the kind of that's just the evolution of uh, of Sikh history with the British Raj within those uh, those few centuries. One question then in terms of kind of how this evolution of, I guess to some degree you would argue it's the evolution of Sikh identity because it's just being reimagined and kind of influenced by the politics of the day. Um, but how did those interactions kind of influence or benefit the social political standing of Sikhs themselves? So like what was the, I know there's obviously jobs and there's money and there's a guaranteed income and there's prestige and X, Y, and Z or whatever. Is that the only benefit or is there more to it than just it being a job and a permanent source of income and maybe prestige in the local community? I think those were all part of it. Um, but there was also a part of um, an opportunity for social mobility that wasn't really available to everyone within the Indian subcontinent, particularly in the late 19th century and early 20th century. The Punjab is, you know, it's becoming over farmed. There's a lot of uh, 
there's fewer and fewer opportunities of for agriculture. And with the British, there's a new network that's offered because Britain has colonies everywhere. You know, the, the sun never sets. And there was an idea that mobility, both geographically, that a loyal subject could go to another British colony and be embraced because they're they're a favored subject. They were, uh, you know, like a model minority, which is the language that some of these texts use. But there was this idea that this segment of the populace is exactly what the British wanted. This is this is perfect. The Sikhs were the ideals, and individual Sikhs. And I saw this, you know, in the in the documents that I, I read, that opened up new possibilities. And yes, it did provide a job and an income, and that's one of the reasons that so many people flocked to the uh, to the armed forces. Because that's that's important, and there weren't a lot of opportunities, especially when you have this exploitative power now coming to try to eke out every bit of capital and value that they possibly could. The ability to say, well, I'm going to be okay, and if I want to go to North America to find other opportunities, I can, because I'm going to be embraced just like I'm going to be embraced here within the Raj. Um, that turned out to be false, and, and I do want to also note that, asking about what those benefits are, the benefits were a lot of promises. You know, we're going to be able to do these things. We're going to be able to to give you a, an ability to control your own fate. Maybe we'll make you know Punjab its own state. Maybe there'll be greater sea control. The British said a lot of things that did not turn out to be true, um, and and it's a hard thing to, for me at least, to to really come to terms with because people are basing their activities on decades later what are very clearly outright lies. But it doesn't change the fact that these, you know, might have been the best hopes that a lot of these people had at the time. You mentioned how a lot of the benefits were kind of promises, and I guess this then also ties into the Komagatu Maru incident in 1914. My question when I was reading through the paper was like, how does this all relate then? Like, what's going on, and why is why is the incident in 1914 such an such a kind of pivotal moment in your study? So the Komagatu Maru. Uh, it's happening in 1914, which is the eve of war. World War One. It's 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 about to happen. But the reason that it's important for my work is because even talking about Sikh traditions of martyrdom, there's it's not one thing. It's not monolithic by any means. And that's not only because okay, this group thinks it's more militarized. This group doesn't. This group has one idea of modeling their deaths after a particular guru's deaths. This one doesn't. But it's also about if martyrdom is a death in service of righteousness, which is more and more how it's kind of articulated within these circles, what is righteousness? What serves the Sikh community the best? So thinking about, okay, you have this increasingly discrete Sikh community. You have encouragement by a colonial power and these promises that things are going to be great because of all these things that you're doing. And again and again, within legal documents, within military documents, even within public documents, the willingness of Sikhs to shed their blood for the British is one of the foremost factors in their preferential treatment or the preferential treatment that they were promised. That all leads to a significant segment of Sikhs in the early 20th century, particularly around World War I, who believe that serving the British is to their benefit. This is what's going to save and even propel the Sikh community forward. It was something that was surprising because we don't think of it in those terms. At least in the U.S., we certainly don't. This is this is driven much more by anti-colonial sentiments that the British were exploiters. You know, this, this is a, this is the colonial power. So to find such ubiquitous support for the British was really surprising. But what I found was that's only one part of the conversation. In England, mostly in Punjab, but also, you know, throughout the battlefields of World War One, there is this sentiment that if we give loyal service, we will derive great benefits. Many Sikhs who had previously emigrated to North America, particularly North America, but also Canada, which is one of the, the main uh, you know, settlements, particularly for uh, Sikhs looking for agricultural work, those ideals have already been shown to be delusions. They're already finding that, oh, I'm not embraced in Canada when I arrive. In fact, there are laws that are becoming on the book to prevent me from going there, even though I'm being told constantly, I'm a great you know, subject. I'm a subject of the crown. So are they. I should have these, um, it's been called hypermobile uh, identities. I can go where I need to because 
I will be respected. Those that had already emigrated to the U.S., uh, which will, they're usually represented by the Gaga party. Um, there's a question as to what role they played or how influential they were. I don't, I don't think any of that uh, is necessary for, for articulating this movement. But within North America, there's already a sense of the British are terrible. They're, they're exploiting us. We need to throw them out of Punjab so that we can re recapture what was lost in the, in the kingdom of Ranjit Singh in, in these glorified Sikh moments of self-rule. So with the kind of globalization of the early 20th century, we have two radically opposing views. One that says we have to support the British. That's what's going to get us our best end. One that says we have to completely get rid of the British. That's what's going to get our best end. And they're both using martyrdom as a means of establishing the rightness or the the truth of their position. In 1914, you have uh, uh, you know the the Komagata Moru, uh, which is a, you know a, a steamer ship that leaves that's carrying mostly Punjabi Sikhs, mostly going through Calcutta, traveling across the ocean, and it's aiming for uh, Vancouver. When it arrives, they're not allowed entry. They're not allowed to dock, and the ship is held on the open water for two months. And over time, the stores are depleting. There's th there's conversations, uh, you know, on shore. But it's this, I mean, this may be a little particular, but the reason that the ship was not allowed to dock was Canada had passed a law called uh, the Continuous Journey Act and said any ship that stops between these two places is not going to be allowed to board or not going to be allowed to land. Of course, no ship consistently went from the Indian subcontinent all the way to Canada. They always stopped somewhere else in East Asia. So it was impossible, and, and it was known that it was impossible. They used that to not allow the Komagatsu Maru to land. And it's, you know, it's it's so tragic that we hear the same rhetoric and the same discourse used. The Canadian official said, oh, there's revolutionaries, there's dangerous people, there's radicals on board that ship. And we don't want to allow them in because that's a security threat to us. The person that, you know, chartered the ship, uh, Gurdit Singh, was likely trying to foment or at least expose the hypocrisy of the British. Because of that, they were so focused on capturing him that when the Komagatsu Maru lands, it's not allowed, it's never allowed to touch Canadian soil. It ultimately has to make the long journey all the way back to the subcontinent. And the passengers who, I don't know, have been in sea for how long? I mean, we're talking almost half a year at this point, are then marched. For, well, they thought they were going to be going one place, and then the passengers start to march somewhere else, and the British react, and there's a skirmish, and about 22 people are killed, another 22 injured in the Butch Butch Massacre. And all of a sudden, there's this moment within both sides, there's many sides, but these two sides of, of, of the Sikh of polity, where it says, wait a second, all of those things aren't coming true. Like that's the opposite of what we thought was going to happen. So it's a pivotal moment for me because I think, at least symbolically, but more and more uh, in actual terms, the tragedy of the Komogatsu Maru and the Bojwood massacre is what brings more people onto the anti-colonial side of the equation and makes people see th these are falsehoods. These are not going to lead where we want. And if that's the case, then we've been deceived and we've been misled. And I think that's what allows the uh, the kind of Goddard Party and the other uh, more anti-colonialist trends to really start to take over. And that it comes at the beginning of a war where you still have these two sides. And it's not, you know, it, there's no internet. There's not how you can find out about these things very quickly. I think it kind of plants the seeds for what blossoms at the end of the war and then onwards into the 20th century where the loyalist identity of the Sikhs is increasingly uh, deteriorated. It's not lost, but it, it's deteriorated. So anti-colonial perspectives kind of seem to take hold, uh, at least in what I've seen. So obviously, Kamagato model happens in 1914. We have the First World War. We then have Jallianwala Bagh. We then have a, a kind of interwar period where Punjab seems to kind of, I guess, stagnate or at least fluctuate between kind of one end to the other. Um, then you have the Second World War, and it doesn't seem like there's really any, like, and this is just an assumption more than based on any kind of research, but it doesn't seem like there's any drop in the amount of Sikh conscription, well, volunteering, obviously, uh, in, in most cases. But 
like it, it seems like there's still almost a chokehold on the Sikh community in terms of getting them into the British Indian Army. So, like, I guess what I'm actually trying to get to is like, how much of an impact do these events like Kamagatu Maru and Jallianwala Bagh and anything else that is getting out, like any other information that is getting to them, like how much of an influence is it happening? I like I completely agree that it's fueling anti colonial sentiment so like Bhagat Singh Udham Singh just to name a couple of famous anti-colonial revolutionaries who are not necessarily inspired but Jalimwala Bagh certainly is a kind of a notch in their bout of things that they are kind of seeking revenge for but like does it really have an impact on the loyalist camps because it kind of seems like it's almost like a family tradition it's like if your grandfather's in the army then your father's in the army and actually like that's all you've ever known so i don't know i guess what yeah i guess what i'm trying to get to is, is like how much of an impact does it have on the loyalist camps or is it just a fact of it pushes those who are already kind of perhaps thinking about that side to actually make the decision of actually yeah like here it is right in front of me clear as day yeah i think it's the latter i think i think even for those that didn't have kind of evidence directly in front of them all of a sudden these increasingly common events are something that kind of tips them over but you're right in terms of enlistment it, it doesn't seem to have a huge uh impact at least not immediately maybe over time but even today you know Sikhs are, are disproportionately represented in armed force and that's you know here in the U.S. as well in fact just a few years ago there was uh you know a law changed so that Sikh soldiers could not have to cut their hair and they could maintain the turban and that was, it was a huge win for for uh, religious freedom and religious rights so I think you're right that it is you know, it is the family tradition. It it is one of the main ways that mobility is possible. That an income and pride can be earned by serving, by having a willingness to sacrifice, by by engaging in these opportunities. And I think you know the 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 concept of the of of seeing Sikhism still encourages this idea that that warriors or that Sikhs are at some part warriors. But it's, I think what's, what we see moving is the inclination, at least in the First World War, really seems driven by we have outcomes that we want to capture. And I think what, as those fade, as those prove to be false, there's just a shift. Like the, the, the path remains the same, but the reasons for the path, I, th I think, begins, uh, begins to shift. Now, I haven't done much work on, uh, you know, post like uh, really post World War II Sikhism, so I can't speak. Uh, categorically to it but yeah from what i've seen and from what i've understood I, I think that's kind of what's happening no no fair enough it's always interesting to try and wrap your head around it because we may think what we want in the 21st century sitting here looking back but obviously things are very different at the time and i think what's always interesting is um it's never inevitable so i think with history we have an issue of looking back and like oh it was always going to be like that like oh x y and z whatever it might be and actually it's never really the case so again it's always interesting to kind of figure out what what's happening um yeah i couldn't agree more so with your work then obviously with your with your study of martyrdom just kind of then working with um it being a comparative piece of work like what are some of the parallels or contrasts that you found then within with the Sikh concept of martyrdom and then say some of the other groups that you've um focused on but what I really tried to center around, uh, because if comparative work is is tricky to do, and it's been done really poorly in the past, and it's kind of given it a bad name. And one of the benefits that I had to studying with uh, with Mark Durgensmeyer is I think he was able to recapture it in a new way. He was really able to recast comparative work, and it's something I've tried to continue in, in different ways. I began with what are groups that use the term martyr or a term that is easily and directly translated as martyr? Not that it's a linguistic focus, but you can find the idea of sacrificing for someone everywhere. You, you can find it all over the place. It's a national, you know, we talk about the ultimate sacrifice for a nation. And I think there's good reasons for that. Um, but I had to figure out a way to kind of wrap my arms around something. So I did that with, okay, these groups are using the language of martyrdom. Martus in early Christianity, but we also get, uh, you know, uh, Shahid and Shahidi, and then we get um, Tibetans who are directly translating for themselves into English that they were memorializing these groups as martyrs. So they started to kind of embrace those. I, I tried to understand what led to the encouragement to offer one's own life. 
And so my work really focuses on firsthand accounts. Uh, with early Christianity, it's, there's a lot of complications and you're not really interested in that. With um, you know the more modern cases with Shia Islam, I was able to find uh, journals, um, videotaped testimonies that occurred before the martyrs. Same with the uh, Tibetans who left behind statements, left behind poetry, left behind their own ideas. And that's why I focused on World War I because I was awed by this enormity of evidence in letters written by uh well punjabi sikhs particularly but really uh indians of all sorts from the front lines to their home and that's only because the british employed censorship they censored the letters and so they maintained copies of the letters and all of a sudden there they are you know and they're still they're still available they're actually digitized right now so anyone can go on and, and be able to read these letters for themselves Looking at how people articulated their own perspective, the things that I found were, one, almost no one says, I'm doing this so I can gain heaven. I'm doing this so I can get some benefit. It's, I'm doing this because this is the right thing to do. I'm interpreting that right thing to do in ways that are, you know, determined by the social and cultural and political state base that they were in. But I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. And I'm doing this because it demonstrates that I am someone who is completely determined by their part in a community. I am a Sikh. I am a Christian. I am a Muslim. I am a Tibetan. How it's argued is, is very different, but they all articulate this position that what is most important about me is that I'm a member of this group, and therefore I'm going to do everything in my power to promote the benefit of this group and I am not going to allow anything to direct me away from this group. There's no, there's nothing that I will do that would make me not be a Sikh, a Christian, you know, a Buddhist. So those are things that are fairly consistent between all of them. And there's in each of these cases, there's an embrace of this is kind of what comes like in this situation, in the situation that I'm in, death is the responsibility. And I have to embrace that. I have to accept that. You know, we talked a little bit about the, you know, the I, me distinction and the death of the ego. It's actually consistent. And I understand how in Jewish, Christian, Muslim uh, sources, it's more complicated because of the eternal heaven that, that awaits them. But when you read their work and when you read the work of those who are embracing them as martyrs, it's no, they did that because it was necessary. It had to be done. I, I do this kind of, uh, this kind of thought experiment. Like if every speak, completely just stopped identifying as Sikh. There, there was no Sikh. And they just said, I'm not going to identify that. I'm going to identify British as American. Just They just leave it off. It disappears. It literally would just disappear. It would just be gone. Again, it's thought experiment. But that means if that is possible, we have to look at the ways that it's maintained. How is this identity maintained? And the importance and the kind of placement of martyrs within all these traditions, Sikhism included, is that what is the highest form, the most celebrated individuals are those that completely gave themselves in service to however they understood it, the group. Now, I don't think this is a, it's not a direct kind of cog in the machine, like this is necessary, but it's a demonstration of this is the limit. These are the lengths that you have to go through if you are going to be considered a member of this community. And at that level, spiritual ideas, theological ideas, they all kind of fall off and you're left with a person who is so determined to live up to the responsibilities they see as incumbent upon them to the group that they're willing to embrace their own death. And in turn, the group celebrates that above everything else. Because what's more important? If everyone could at the drop of a hat just decide not to be this, and you have these people who are so determined to be understood as this, that they would die for it, that they would rather die than give it up. Well, that's what's going to support the group. That's what's going to maintain the group's coherence and the group's identity throughout. And I think that's consistent with all of the different cases that I've, that I've looked at, including Sikhism. Just on the, um, on the point that you made about, um, the, about there being, like, needing a, a community in order to celebrate the, the, the martyr in this case I guess it's kind of like that that saying whether like if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it did it fall right and there That's needs right. to be yeah there needs to be someone there to hear it in order for it to for them to go tell the story which I completely get and I completely agree 
Yeah. I'm stealing that. I love that. Okay, I like it. And, and I like your thought experiment as well. If everyone stopped identifying, which again, I completely agree and see where you're coming from. But for me, one thing that's really interesting is if you took the philosophy of the Guru Granth Sahib Ji and or, or even the passages from the Dasam Granth, which the entire thing pretty much indicates that this is a false reality that we're living in and there's an ego and there's kind of a there's a divine truth for want of better words that exists behind this thin veil right that philosophy alone doesn't require there to be someone to experience it because the only person that matters within the act of martyrdom is yourself right because it's your ego or you or whatever like whatever the bit is at that point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i like i i get what you mean by the whole there has to be like as in when the tree falls in the forest someone needs to be there to to, to hear it but i guess what i'm saying is is that is that is secondary to the act because the person doing the act doesn't actually get like i don't know this is my assumption but the person doing the act doesn't really care care whether I'm sure there are plenty of people who are doing it because they want the fame or whatever they assume will give it will give them post to their death or whatever reward mechanism or whatever but I guess what I'm saying is is like the motivation behind the martyrdom is the martyrdom itself rather than the community although the community has to exist in order to keep that tradition alive because by default a martyr like stop like they're dead like they can't mm -hmm. they can't keep it alive right, right? right. um right. it's really important so uh just to just to briefly hit upon it because you hit on two themes that are actually central to my work the case of motivation and the case of truth motivation like we talked about already if someone's dying to be remembered like if they're dying for fame and there's there's been uh particularly in kind of radical salabi jihadist you know act of terrorism very clear ideas that some people are simply dying because they want the fame. They want to be embraced by a certain group. We wouldn't consider terrorists, and this, you know, this is where we get this language issue too, right? One person's terrorist, another person's freedom fighter. One person's martyr is another person's criminal. And there's there's no way around that because there is no absolute uh, values that we can impose on it. Yes, I, there are certainly groups that I'm like, these people should not be considered martyrs. They're doing horrifying things. But I can't, as an academic, I can't say, yes, yeah, so you don't count as a martyr. All I can do is say, well, this group embraces you as a martyr, so why are they doing this? Motivation is central, and it's actually something, again, in every single case, the motivation is what's most important. With the Christians, it was, uh, are you motivated to, to die because you want to be, you just want to oppose Rome? Like, is that your whole goal? There's so many stories of early Christian martyrs um, you know, and I know, I know this is not what you're interested in, but it's a fascinating story. No, it's still on. interesting. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> no, go ahead. Early Christian martyrs are often represented as like just these people that are just like, get bent Rome, like I'm here doing my thing. And like, I don't care. And I'm, I'm just going to die. And the Romans are the, are portrayed as these people like you, how dare you? Like, we are going to kill everyone that opposes us. The actual, the closest documents are the most reliable and they're not very reliable even then. But what we see is, the Roman authorities saying to these prisoners, like, hey, we're just asking you to, you know, light a little bit of incense and sacrifice. Like, if you just light this little bit of incense, you're good. We're not going to kill you. We don't want to kill you. All you have to do is just light this little bit of incense. That will pay homage to the emperor. And then you can go on your way and, like, do your thing. And it's the Christians who are like, no, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. I could never do such a thing. And the Roman authorities say, like, Take some time, like go think about it for a few days. And the, the Romans are just stunned by this resilience, this resistance, like just light a little bit of incense and you can live. Christians say, I would be motivated to save my own life at the expense of my identity as a Christian. So there's their motivation. In Islam, the motivation can't be, I am doing this to get to heaven. If you're doing this so you could get heaven, then God will not judge you as a martyr. God will not accept you as a martyr, but that's not up to you. That's not up to your community. And this is getting back to, to your point. This is up to God and no one has any idea. So, uh, you know, uh, Islamic martyrdom is often based on niyyah, which is, uh, you know, intention. What is your intention? It reaches its height with the Buddhists because your karma is not fully determined by your actions. It's determined by your intention. If you're trying to do something good and you mess up 
and a bad thing happens, well, you don't get negative karma for that because your intention was still good. What the intention of the self-immolators are is not something that they can fully decide, although that's why I look at firsthand accounts because I want to try to understand their intention. But it's also not something that the community can decide. It's outside of their hands. So again and again, I see these you know, communities saying, I think you're a martyr, but we'll see what God says. I think you're a martyr, but we'll see what your next life brings. Like, I think you did something right. And so then, then we'll kind of go. And this is why I, I think it goes back to this idea of truth. What's the truth of the act? Is it truly an act of martyrdom? Who gets to decide? The community decides, and, and here's where my, uh, you know, secular academic kind of side comes out in contrast to some of the, uh, the ways that spiritual traditions or religious traditions embrace martyrs. Functionally, the community decides who's a martyr by remembering them as a martyr. Um, there's, uh, you know, I, I don't know how much of the, goings on the political goings on uh, in america have you know crossed our shores but in january 6th a few years ago there was this you know mobilization against the capitol and a young woman was killed as she was trying to breach the capitol and she's remembered as a martyr by certain segments of the american polity now most people say she was breaking and entering like this was a this was a legal killing it's tragic but she's not a martyr but again who's to say the truth of this it's a group can embrace it by saying, I think what you did was right. I support what you did. I want to promote that. But they can't say you qualify as the martyr. So going back to your original point, the act of martyrdom has to be the sole motivation because you're trying to do what's right. If you're doing it for some benefit to you, you're going to be excluded. And the decider, the who gets to choose those things, is never in the martyr's hands. I think functionally they can say it's in the community's hands because they use the label, but spiritually, religiously, it's outside of their hands as well. It does this truly align with the concepts within the tradition that they're a part of. No, definitely. Yeah. You said I could go on and on. So I took No, I enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just having to take a moment or two just to process like and ensure that I'm keeping up. But no, no, no. I'm more than more than welcome to 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 continue. Um so just kind of backtracking slightly to what we were discussing about kind of how the concept of Shahidi is, um, uh, I guess, I don't know. I think manipulated is perhaps a word that's too harsh, but I, for, I, I don't have a better choice at the moment. So I'm going to go with that. But it's essentially manipulated by the British, uh, British Empire, the British Indian Army, um, and a concept which i guess you could argue is a uh, uh, or like at its base is a philosophical or a spiritual concept of just sacrificing yourself whether you, however you define that ego or whatever is then transformed into something where you're sacrificing it for a nation for a very or, or for at least a political entity rather than it being a spiritual essentially rather than it being a conversation between you and the divine it's now become a conversation between you and a power structure a political structure i guess i guess the question that i'm trying to get to is to what extent is this sovereign collectively that's not bound by any uh, national or political boundaries again taking from, from from your work influenced then by their service to the british indian army because it seems like the process of colonization is literally occurring through people joining the army and coming back with a very particular idea of loyalty and sacrifice um which i would argue and i know a lot of people who've probably been on the podcast and listening to the podcast may not agree but i would argue that's kind of counter to what Sikh ethos is at its very heart which is always kind of point like shouting to at the power structure or like at least try like there's some friction against the power structure um mm -hmm. so just coming back to the question rather than me um just babbling on but like yeah what like how is this process influencing the community's own ideas of what it means to be loyal and what the idea of sacrifice and shahidi actually mean i don't i don't think manipulation is the wrong term I do think it is an intentional shaping of peak, peak spiritual understanding towards particular ends. And I think we can qualify that as, uh, you know, as intentional manipulation. Um, and okay, I'll see if I can get, cause I want to get to the, to the, to the second part, because I, I tend to agree with the idea that 
the Sikh ethos, as you put it today, is um, it's it's social justice oriented. It's you know, these power structures are the problem, and it's one of the reasons I was so surprised when I started reading through these these letters because I'm so ingrained with that in mind because I do think today, 21st century, I do think that is the dominant form. Not you can never speak singularly. You can never speak monolithically about any you know group, tradition, faith. You, you just can't. But I do think it's dominant today. So when I came across these sentiments of loyalty, I was surprised. And, and I and I tried to find out this very question that, that you're asking. I think there's a few different parts to the answer. One is, we talked a little bit about how Sikh soldiers were really embraced and, and sought after by the British. And that's coming out of, in part, what's known as the uh, martial, race, martial races theory, which is uh, this this kind of catch-all category that the British used when they were figuring out how to create uh, the best possible uh, army, particularly, uh, you know, the BIA, the British Indian Army, there was this concept that certain races, and races, races itself, a social construct, there's different conceptions of race, uh, you know, what we think of as race in the U.S. is very different from you in the U.K., and we're very different uh, from the British Raj as well. But there was this idea that certain races, whether or not... Sikhs were a race is something that's actually debated in several several circles. So that's a whole nother track we can go down. But the British thought because of the area of the Punjab, or Punjab, excuse me, because of the area where Sikhs were kind of fostered, they had developed an innate, not only fighting ability, but defensive ability in particular. Sikhs were sought after because they were defenders. And that's partially because they were unwilling to relinquish even an inch of land in Punjab when the East India Trading Company was coming. So there was this evidence that's then rolled into these really horrifyingly stereotyping, you know, broad ideas of the racial, uh, of the martial racist theory. But because of that, they're sought after. Because of that, the British are very happy to say, we don't want you to stop being Sikh. In fact, being Sikh is precisely why we want you, because you're so amazing at this. Look at this. You won't give up a foot of ground. And over time, the British use a number of different mechanisms to support those very ideas and to promote a martialized idea of the Sikh ethos, that Sikhi was in itself military, that it's at its core. So, you know, the, the inauguration into the British Indian Army, I, I, don't, I don't think it's the case with modern armies, but in World War One, there was a kind of... Um, you, you swore on the, uh, you know, on the holy books. You went through an induction ceremony that included aspects of, uh, you know, Sikh practices. Uh, they explicitly, the British explicitly stated that anyone who was not uh, a Sikh Sikh did not count as a Sikh. And in their surveys would exclude them from being incorporated as Sikh. There were um, called Granthis. There were people in the army who would read scripture constantly. There were... Um, you know, in the induction ceremonies, soldiers had to actually swear on the ground, but then there was the officers, the British officers would take part in the ceremony saying, hey, we're in, like, we're part of this. We we are connected in these new ways. And I think it's it's so, it goes so far in explaining what today appears as, as kind of mind-blowing. Like, why would these people be so loyal to an exploitative, you know, union that that's that's only there to get what they can and, and completely dismay. But the British were really effective in demonstrating themselves not only as, how do I want to say it? Celebrators of Sikhness, but also as a righteous ruler in and of themselves. Because in, in, in the letters that I read, you can see this. They respected Sikh traditions. They encouraged Sikhs practice. They had spaces for the uh, for the grant. Like it was all a part of it. So there's this explicit encouragement. We want you to be Sikh, this kind of Sikh. We want to maintain your Sikhness because it helps us and because at your core, you are defensive warriors and that's what we need. So if you have a group that is giving you some preferential treatment in, in the military, you're they're maintaining, uh, you know, cores that are made mostly of Sikhs that are including these religious practices and that are telling the soldiers, hey, we want you to be this. They come across as benefactors. There's someone that actually wants the part of the Sikh. There's this um, 
a truly apocryphal tale that uh, Guru um, Tej Bahadur, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, when he was imprisoned, looked west and said, from there our salvation will come against the Mughals. And so some people are saying the British were prophesized, like they are the saviors and they will be the ones to promote the benefits of uh, of the Sikh community of the Pond going forward. So I think that makes it reasonable to have these individuals who have been militarized, who have been brought up in these ideas and had it reinforced consistently to see this organization, this institution as benefactors, that these are a righteous ruler. And, and in many cases, they explicitly say, the king is for Sikhs. The king is doing this for Sikhs. Even some of them, we talked about motivation. Some are saying, the king didn't enter into this war with any agenda. Like They're not trying to accomplish anything. This is simply a battle for righteousness, and we want to take part in it. The most common theme that I came across in, in the letters written by, um, by Sikh set boys was, we have to be true to, one, to our soul. The British provided the means of Sikh well-being, and if we, when called upon, would refuse to pay back the debt that we've incurred because of their activities, we would be outside of our responsibilities, and, and we couldn't. This is the true. This is what a true Sikh would do: would be repay these things because this is the group that made it possible for us to have what we have. How then do you think that the Sikh community's uh, perception of their own history and identity? especially in, in, in relation to martyrdom, has then evolved just over the whole kind of stretch that you've uh, studied from kind of obviously its origins to, I guess, like the First World War. Like, if you were to summarize it, how would you kind of pa package that together? The uh, the uh, the shifting kind of nature of Sikh martyrdom over time? Yeah, yeah. and also kind of the, the community's perception, because I think what's interesting is with the British Indian Army is, is that it's almost like a self, not a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it's almost self kind of uh, self-perpetuating in the sense of you can script, you're indoctrinated, quote unquote, in terms of like there's a particular idea of loyalty and sacrifice that is being recalibrated towards a king in a country and a and and again the Guru Granth is there, but it's not direct allegiance just to that. It's allegiance to something in addition to that, which is this king and empire, which in itself is is quite a step away from just allegiance to the guru, quote unquote. But yeah, how, like, I guess just to summarize, like, what, how would you say that it's evolved from its origins to kind of, I don't know, maybe post, just post the, the First World War? I think I would summarize it as what is consistent throughout the Sikh traditions of martyrs uh, that I read. Uh, and I should also say that, you know, there's uh, Louise Fennick wrote a book called Martyrdom in the Sikh Tradition, which anyone interested in this topic should immediately get. It's brilliant, it's thoughtful, it's it's clear, and does a much better job in you know several hundred pages than I'm doing right now. But I think what is consistent is the idea that virtue, as it was understood in these early Sikh communities, 18th, 19th, up to the 20th century, was always consistent that serving the guru also included serving others serving Sikhs particularly, but serving the good of all. I think that's consistent. I think we still see that today. What shifted was, how is the good served? Is the good served by rejecting these colonialist masters, which is what, you know, I think I think took hold, again, post uh, Komogathi Maru, post, uh, post World War One, and especially post World War Two, especially, you know, with the partition of uh, India and Pakistan, when Punjab is just bisected, and and, and the, the writings around that are, are horrifying and really kind of tragic. But is that the way that righteousness is served? If so, then those people who died in service to that goal should be considered martyrs. At the time, for the reasons we've just gone over, is righteousness actually better served by supporting the crown, which is responsible for the well-being of Sikhs of, you know, Indians of however the you know the subcontinent uh, you know under the Raj was articulated is that the best way to procure the greatest benefit for Sikhs for everyone and if so then service to the British is service to the Guru because 
they're fulfilling the same function. And I think that's the the common trend. And I think that's where we see the, the kind of shift and the and the change in perspective over time. No, no, thank you for that. It's very um very nuanced as well, like very precise in terms of kind of actually demarcating how that changed. So no, thank you. One thing that caught my attention, and this is more so because I'm one of those, uh, what you'd call, well, I'm actually the son of, but uh, I come from a family which is which has been defined as like, uh, what is it they call them, twice migrated, so from India to Africa and then from Africa to the UK. And reading your work, which was really interesting, obviously, one thing that caught my eye was the mention that there was a plan at some point to give Sikhs territory within East Africa. It's not a surprise in it in the the idea itself just because of how um influential indians were in colonizing east africa zanzibar tanzania kenya uganda you name it um from a place that is essentially unhabitable and essentially thick jungle to being uh i guess colonized um and again i will be the first to admit that the indians are essentially colonizers they, they are just they are the middleman between the empire and the indigenous population but it is a surprise to hear that there was a plan to give them some type of sovereignty so i know anyone who's probably got some type of east african heritage and there are a lot of us within the uk listening are probably very interested so like what like the the, the child in me is going like what the hell is going on but like like what like what where did the yeah. idea come from? Well, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did the idea come from? What happened? And I guess also, why didn't it actually, like, why didn't it occur, like, become a reality as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's so funny, you know, because, well, you read the chapter, so, you know, it's really just a line. I'm just I'm like, oh, yeah, it is, yeah, exactly. Nothing really came of it. So when, when we were talking, you know, we're preparing, I'm like, oh, great. I'd love to talk about this because it's something that I didn't do a lot of archival work. And I'm going, I want to completely admit that I know how nerdy this is about to sound there is just magic in archival work like there's just something that happens when you know i'm looking for this document and i get this whole packet and so of course i just start flipping through and this is one of those situations there was this memorandum written that uh is actually a series of writings that occurred at a fairly high level within the british government that not only is there a desire within the Sikh community for, at the very least, equal representations on the level of Hindus and Muslims, like there, there was really this idea that because of their service, because of their willingness to sacrifice, and because of their loyalty to the crown, they should be at least on those levels. And I, and I say that because, you know, as you and I'm sure many of your listeners know, when when the subcontinent is, you know, is bifurcated, it was done largely on the idea of religion. Pakistan is going to be the home for the Muslims and India is going to be the home for the Hindus. And it's not like that. It never was like that. And the horrors of, of partition, you know, are, are really, um, I think, a testament to, well, the horrors of the British Empire in general. But and all that aside, there was this sense that Sikhs felt, well, let, like, get us in. Like, we should be part of this. At the same time, there's this concern about German East Africa because, uh, not only Sikhs, but Indians are being, they're having a hard time, but they're also being encouraged to leave behind their kind of British subjecthood. If you no long, if you kind of sheer ties to the British, the Germans were saying, hey, we'll give you these privileges, we'll give you these rights. There's an encouragement to leave behind one, uh, you know, kind of subjecthood or another. And, and Germany doesn't have a part in the, uh, in the colonization of Africa that they wanted. There's this um, you know, this lack of pride about not having a piece of a continent, which is just so disgusting and horrifying that, you know, I teach about this and I kind of, I kind of rage against it, but there we are. And that's, that's where things are. So as Sikhs are saying, Hey, we should be getting, you know, our own equal representation. There's this sense by many of the British officials, well, if we give it to the Sikh community, well, then where other communities are going to kind of pop out, who else is going to want more at the same time with the Indians being treated in German East Africa. There's a sense of, well, we got to step in there and stop that. We can better deploy our forces in colonizing Africa than the Germans could. And I, I want to say, you know, I really appreciate the the willingness to kind of face history and be like, this this is what it is. You know, I'm a white man in America. You know, I'm not trying to do that myself. Like we have to, we have to accept the history that that you know kind of comes from things. And it was intended as another step of colonizing and 
the language that is always used uh, in colonial circles, civilizing the Africans. We have to civilize them. And there was a sense that these Indians are these wonderful subjects. They would be great at civilizing uh, East Africa. And so there are fairly high-level talks. I mean, Winston Churchill himself talks about the idea of at least kind of creating um, like a, a, a part of the Raj, putting German East Africa, taking it from the Germans and putting it under the administration of the Raj. So it's kind of this, you know, this bisecting thing. And at least at some point, uh, a man named uh, Major Goodfellow said, hey, this is a great opportunity to provide the Sikhs with what they want and create a new British colony in East Africa. So maybe we should bring these two things together and allow some, in, uh, you know, this is still pre-World War II, right? So this is still the heart of the empire. So it wouldn't be that they would be fully sovereign, but something like Canada, you know? Like it's their own thing, but they're still loyal. And I think that was much more of the perspective, you know, a, a suzerainty rather than a full on sovereignty. But there was a sense that we need to do better. The, our people are already suffering there. The Sikhs have proven themselves to be loyal citizens and, uh, you know, th these model subjects. And we want to repay them for all that they've done. This is a great opportunity to do so. Now, the why it didn't work is kind of lost to history. There's not a lot of documentation. There's there's some discussion, but it seems to kind of fizzle out pretty quickly. And um, so I don't know why it was opposed. Um, but my guess is, you know, empires have a short attention span. And other things is kind of I kind of got in the way and it's pretty much dropped. But that was just one of those like dumb luck stumbled onto this folder of these memorandums. And it's like, what, what is happening here? I didn't even know this was an option, you know, much less uh, a real a real possibility. Well, it makes a lot of sense in two ways because um, I, I'm trying to actually find the book on my shelf now, but um, I can't see it. But there's a book I've been reading about um, Indians in East Africa, and it's talking about when the British Empire were first kind of colonizing the, East, the, the coast of East Africa, essentially... The rupee is and and it and it stays as a currency within East Africa for 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 decades because of the fact that because of the fact that there is so much trade going on between um the two and actually I think there's a map yeah there's a map just behind me on there no this one and I think if you can huh? I don't know whether you can make it out but there's like India at the top East Africa's this side and Australia's on the other side. Which kind of also makes it a little bit clearer about why then East Africa is so important because obviously there's a trade triangle going on. Um, and then it also makes more sense in 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 the fact of why then Idi Amin in Uganda tells all the Asians to piss off because obviously in his mind, um, and right for like, there's obviously a personal um emotional attachment to that because my family were one of those families that were kicked out. But equally, I'm very aware of the fact that we were also there as a process of the colonization. So it's one of those things, right? Um, but it makes sense in terms of then why there was that attitude towards Asians from Africans. And equally, you only have to go and ask certain a certain generation of African Sikhs um, about their understandings or their attitudes towards Africans and I think you'll very quickly learn um it's not the nicest um but then equally I think the social structure of the fact that a lot of Indians when they were in East Africa um and I can I guess I can only talk really on behalf of people in Kenya like a lot they would own the business or the sawmill or whatever it is and the employees or the people arguably below them would all be African so there's also this kind of and and Edi Amin played on it brilliantly in terms of being like, well, we don't own anything. These guys own all, they these guys own it all, and we're just working for them. So, yeah. Anyway, putting that just kind of to the side, I just wanted to ask then: Are there any other kind of random and interesting facts that you've come across? Because I saw that, and I it doesn't necessarily have a massive part to play in your work. Um, and as you mentioned, it's just one sentence, kind of almost like a footnote. Um, <laughs> it caught my eye and I went, bloody hell, this is... Because it adds another layer to the whole narrative of Sikh sovereignty and then obviously how... Um, and it's just also just providing more evidence because a lot of the time there are narratives put out that are just based on, well, so-and-so told me. Whereas at least here, right, right, they're right. like, well, actually, I've, we've seen the memo and 
kind of a proper yeah. conversation about it. So, I got an archival reference. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is there anything else that, and it doesn't necessarily have to be related to, to Sikhs, but is there anything else you've come across and you've been like, bloody hell, I'm like, this is, this is mind blowing. Yeah, uh, so many things because, you know, as I said, it wasn't a subject that I was particularly well read on before this, knew enough about it and, and had enough interest to say, all right, I really want to pursue this. But being exposed to these documents, it's just a fascinating thing. For instance, the idea that there were British censors who were like, we're going to make sure we're going to take every piece of mail and we're going to make sure there's no anti-colonial sentiments going back. Like that in and of itself, that it resulted in just hundreds upon hundreds. And what I really spent the most of my time doing within the archives was sifting through them and being like, okay, you know, these are written by Sikhs. These are not. But from there, well, okay, uh, this is referenced as a, as a job. Is that is that a job seek? Is that is that not so this one's reference is a job seek? This one is just seek. How are how are we using these categories? We often joke, you know, I, I'm I'm a scholar of religion and in religious studies, we say people think we study religion, but we really don't. We really study categorization. Like how are we categorizing that stuff? So that was fascinating. Coming across these surveys and and reading these discussions about, oh, well, we think uh, that Sikhs are a branch of Hinduism, but these groups are really rejecting that. But this group is saying we are, and this one is not, so we're going to count them in this way. Like that whole thing was kind of fascinating in and of itself. I will also say, stumbling upon this kind of loyalist, loyalist thread uh, of, of Sikh soldiers, I really didn't expect that. And it was something that I was very aware of as I, as I started publishing and presenting on this material, is that it, it went against the grain of, not only how I think a, a great deal of Sikh communities imagine the past, but like you said, that this ethos of feeling like uh, an agent of a colonialist group is an uncomfortable thing. And, and it's not something that is, is usually sought after. So to be exposed to it and then trying to understand, well, how does this shift? Because I know it shifts. Is really what led me to this this kind of dual project that I worked on. Um, but the the one other thing that I'll say that really shocked me because and it still kind of surprises me. So much of what was happening in the early twentieth century within the subcontinent was articulated around religion. I I could we could talk at length about what a religion is, how it's qualified. But again, we're categorizers, so I'm not going to do any of that. But op opposition to the Christian evangelical proselytization that was going on heavily at the time and opposition to the increased Hindu nationalism, which of course we can still see happening, particularly with Narendra Modi and, and you know, the movements that we're seeing today. Those being some of the driving concerns that not only formed like the Gestapo and the Chief Council of Dawan, but, but was so interested, was so of interest to people in that day, I wasn't expecting. And then I come across this small segment that and ongoing for a few months about the envelopes soldiers were using to send materials home. And I thought, what on earth are we? It was one of those, like, this is stupid. Like, I got to see what this is about. Yeah, 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 about yeah. the envelopes, you know? But it turns out that the YMCA, the Young Man's Christian Association, which is, you know, mostly like a sporting thing. It's like where you go to a gym here in America now, but was part of a proselytizing institution, was providing for free envelopes to soldiers in the in the bia here you go you need an envelope here you go send this home a very nice thing to do you don't gotta buy an envelope postmarked as these are sent back to particularly punjab the people receiving them see a cross and they say wait a second this is this are you trying to convert me are you suggesting that my family has already been converted is this one more means of converting the troops and there's an uproar about it and in the even in the documents like the people raging against it are raging against it they're like this is horrifying like this is imposing religion where it doesn't belong this is one more a, a, attempt to make christianity the nation and the british are kind of like oh that, they're envelopes like i just thought they were envelopes like they didn't really have <laughs> <laughs> so there's this like completely missed opportunity for understanding. And 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 to be fair, once it was brought to the to the uh, army officials, they were like, stop, stop doing that. Like, please. Yeah. Stop doing that. <laughs> but that it was this moment of true outrage was fascinating. And then this is days later after I had, I had uncovered that and really just was like, that's random. And I like made a little <laughs> note and I'm like, that's weird, you know.
I come across a few different let, uh, letters written by Sikhs that I always find is really interesting. Because remember, these are censored letters. So I'm reading the censor's uh, you know, transcript that says, um, hey, listen, when you're sending me stuff, if you have anything like uh, opium or if you have anything that would like get stuff, use the YMCA envelopes because those go through much more easily. So there's a sense within the army that like we can use this to get materials that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Meanwhile, the other side is like, don't ever use these again. This is proselytization. And it was just that, you know, it's like sometimes that curtain is pulled back and you get this little glimpse of what happened in this place in time. Um, and it was, it was nothing I ever would have looked for. But it was like, what the hell is happening here? You know? But that is the fun, isn't it? Of being able to kind of almost peer into someone else. Like, and I think the beauty of those those little bits is the fact that like i think with history quite quickly the people get lost and it becomes a narrative or a theory or whatever but that is like is literally being the per or being in that person's head or getting as close to that person as you can and i love it i love how on one side you've got people being like religious it's terrible they're trying to convert us and the other guys are like yo this is this is our opportunity <laughs> to do the biggest drug haul that you can imagine, right? And I even love that, like, you know, the censors are charged with, like, make sure there's nothing bad about Britain being written here. And so they see that and they're like, well, I mean, that's not, that's not what I'm looking for. I guess I'm looking to pass this along. <laughs> We're not going to prevent the soldiers from getting their drugs. We're just going to kind of keep going along that's with this. And, crazy. and I, Yeah, I was just such a weird little matrix of, uh, of, of events. And I, I totally agree. It's like, oh. That's what was important to them at the time. Not these macro level, you know, political movements. It's like, you know, I need some weed and I need you to use this envelope to get it out here. <laughs> Do I need to get my A-class grade or whatever it is? I need to get the best stuff in it. Right from the They were good, too. There's a lot of stuff about like how we can get, you know, items that should not be shipped shipped to us. They were they were very skilled and very knowledgeable at the time. And again, it just goes to show what they were concerned with. But I also think it's really funny how in a lot of ways things haven't changed like as in even the comment like so the conversation about Sikhs being uh kind of conscript or volunteering into the British Indian Army like those kind of conversations occur even today even like even within kind of UK British Sikh circles even in American Sikh circles of this kind of idea of like should we be kind of joining these armies should we not be there are obviously arguments on both camps um and again it comes back to that human thing which is like drugs food taxes like you name it those kind of things that always come up in people's lives and you see it 100 odd years ago 110 years ago in someone's in in someone's letter back like it's just it's incredible yeah. it's incredible people are people always no yeah, matter yeah, where, no matter when, like, people are people this is what definitely are. um just a few then light-hearted questions to kind of wrap up the the podcast with which is if you could have any i'm sorry if you could have dinner with any historical figure that you've researched or studied or come across who would it be and why i thought about that uh, so i think in in this context in the context of uh, you know this particular chapter in this uh, this particular say I, I would have to say guru gobind singh like sea change everything changes not only with you know the ending of the human guru lineage and the creation of of the granth as guru like that's that's fascinating and then the the introduction of the you know the omri baptism like i'm just it's all so unexpected from somebody outside who's just coming and they're wait i read all this stuff and then all of a sudden this is, is taking in all these different directions i'm really fascinated i just want to know more and, and oftentimes you know when i think about those I, I do tend to think about like you know certain founders like okay uh, i don't think so much as you know what would jesus be doing if i could go back in time what would the prophet muhammad be doing but like I just want to be like with the people nearby like what are you doing you know you see this happening and if, if we really humanize it like what's going on in, in these particular moments but when i was thinking that everything so often goes back to the 10th guru i mean it, it, this it is so defining and not that the the earlier gurus are, are you know any way unimportant but the 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 features the contours of sikhism as we see today are so shaped it just i just kind of want to like just sit there What's going on here? What, what's happening? Right? Let's talk about this. Let's kind of let's kind of see where it's going. So, um, I think that's who I, I would have to go with in this particular oh. case. 
No, fair. Yeah, I don't think many people listening would disagree with that. So, <laughs> good, good choice, good choice. Oh, I'm like, yeah. What's then perhaps the most interesting or unusual source that you've come across with your research? Like anything that you've been like, this is a random bit of information. You know what? I'm sorry. I don't know if you can hear my cat. It's about time. It's almost time for him to eat. It's actually really early for him to eat, but he's going to be whining and complaining anyway. So, uh, yeah, I apologize if he comes through the mic. Um, you know, in terms of... If we're talking broadly, a few different things come to mind. Going through the letters, you know, the, the research that I was telling you about, that affected me differently because it was so personal. Like, just like you said, the big stuff, these political movements, you know, how Sikhism is idealized or how it is, that's not really what most of them were. Most of them were, you know, how's, how's this person doing? What's going on at home? How's the farm? You know, and it's so personal that it was really something. I would say you know if we're going along those same lines and if i can kind of draw a parallel to the other work that i've done for this book reading the poetry of uh tibetan self-immolators people who are about to go set themselves on fire to write this beautiful poetry praising tibet praising the dalai lama praising uh you know buddha and, the, and buddhism in general there's just something Again, I, I think you're right in that humanizing thing. You're like, this is this is a real person. This is a person that is doing something that I really can't fathom. And they're doing it with this this eye to beauty. And, and so getting getting hands on that was, was something you know really, really interesting. When I started watching the videotaped testimonies of Hezbollah human bombs, people who were about to go, you know, commit I, I don't want to say commit suicide because Suicide is a very problematic term when it comes to self-sacrifice. Uh, oh, for the same reasons we were talking about. If uh, if it is a suicide, it is because you are depressed and you are serving yourself by removing suffering. You know, that's a person, that's a selfish act. If, uh, if it's a martyrdom, then it's a communal act. We shouldn't call it suicide. We can go on about that. But when they're going to take their own lives in an act of rebellion, in an act of resistance, they're saying some very similar things. Like there is a scripted nature of those videos, but you're face to face with someone like that's a human. That's even if the act that they're doing are rightly construed as evil, they don't think of themselves as evil. Like this is just, this is a person trying to do what they think is right. And my job kind of becomes, you know, figuring out uh, why they think it's right. And, and you know, how, how that could possibly make sense to them. And the, the last, and this is something I haven't even had to work on yet. This is something that very few people know. We talked a little bit about the ultimate sacrifice for a nation can be construed very similarly to to uh, you know an ultimate sacrifice for religion, and I think that's actually really important and really intentional because I do think modern national identities are trying to fill in for what religious identities used to provide in the past, and so I now that this book is is going to be coming out, I'm starting to think about a follow up project that would look at secular forms of martyrdom. Uh, in the troubles in Ireland, uh, in the uh, you know the Tokatai or the, the Kamikaze Japanese fighter pilots in 1940s, and when I had a chance to go to Shanghai a few years ago, and I was just walking around Shanghai, I came across the Chinese Communist Party Martyr Cemetery. That was the Englishized name, and I stood looking at it, and I said, "Wow, I've just found like a new source for my own research," but. The Chinese Communist Party is explicitly atheist, ostensibly, determinedly atheist. And here I am faced with them using this, this kind of same language. And there's a museum with writings and there's all this material. And it was one of those moments that I kind of stood back and said, well, I guess I now have a new project that I'm going to have to take up after that. So I haven't been able to dive into it yet, but I was completely surprised by that. Um, and I know that was, you asked for one and I gave you four, I think. No, 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 I appreciate that. <laughs> My question then just off the back of that is, do you need a concept of the divine in order for there to be a concept of martyrdom? Because I would argue that like the concept of God or the divine doesn't actually factor into the Sikh concept of martyrdom. I know a lot of people perhaps listening to this would counter argue that, but again, I think that comes down to your interpretation of how you understand what like Sikhi or Sikhism is. Um, but like, do you like just putting that all to the side, do you have to have a concept of God in order for there to be an, or not necessarily God, but a concept of there being a something above, something that can, something that is in control of the situation because the only thing that I can be in control of is the act or 
or putting myself in the situation of ending up in death doesn't necessarily mean like what do you know what i mean so yeah you got religious studies chops man you're asking the right question you're approaching it in the right ways um because you know when you did that thing of like do you need a concept of the divine that next step was like okay but what do we exactly mean like how is this going to be a different you know is this is this an agent like the kind of you know you like the abrahamic god where it's like i am a being that has will and desire and you know kind of changes the thing desire would be problem for the theologians or is it a concept of you know and you ended up in this you know something in control but here again we're with this concept of an agent a willful something that can look and judge and evaluate whether however that's done and i don't think that's necessary for martyrdom what I do think is necessary for martyrdom is a sense of the sacred. You have to have something sacred. What that means, how we determine what counts as the sacred, well, now we've opened it up to how do we include all of these various traditions that incorporate a willing self-sacrifice towards the concept of the sacred that can be radically different. So, you know, there are some, uh, in some of the letters that I read, some of the, the Sikh soldiers said, they, they communicated an idea of heaven, like there was an afterlife that they were going to try to go to, which is usually out of keeping with how uh, many others kind of have the conception of, of Sikhi. And again, I'm an academic, I can't parse those, I can't evaluate those. But because groups like the, you know, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, can effectively use the language of martyrdom towards its own end, suggests to me, okay, what is at stake here is something that exceeds the self. But once we try to step beyond that as to articulate what it is that exceeds the self, then we get into these parochial questions of like individual tradition. So do we need the divine? I don't think so, because we see evidence that martyrs don't always look to the divine. There are no cases where the martyrs are separate from an idea of the sacred of something greater than themselves so then it just becomes well how do we how do we kind of manage that how do we artic uh, articulate that idea I, I don't know i hope this is the last question although i have another question in the back of my head which i may ask you uh kind of post the recording um but let's let's just let's just continue for the for this one which is if you could ask a question to any of the soldiers so those letters that you read were obviously written by uh soldiers who were part of the british indian army um Obviously, many of them would have been Sikh, and as you were talking about earlier, some of them you weren't quite sure, and I'm sure you read many that weren't Sikh. But if you could ask any of those soldiers a question, what would it be, and why? I had a very interesting response to this question, because what I considered it, when I, what would I ask someone whose letter I read, I really quickly became emotional. I kind of got choked up. And I think it's because, like I said, these were humans, like these were people. And recognizing not only that most likely every, you know, letter writer that I read is, is now deceased just because these are written in the 1914th uh, and they're already adults. But just the idea that these were young men who were facing down death on the battlefield and they were doing it for what they held to be right. You know, it was funny, it's like lighthearted. It just hit me hard. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm about to weep here. And I, I got to really think about this. I mean, I think the, like the scholar in me would ask like specifics about what life was like in these cores. Like what was their daily life? Like, what was it like to, to have their religion be such a part of, of their military service. But I think if I could, if I could also kind of have the benefit of retrospection I would want to kind of say, like, listen, I, I, I really do understand and I really believe I, I have come to an understanding of how this empire whose excesses and horrors have been well documented and are well known. I understand how they could appear as a righteous agent, but I would also want to know, like, well, looking back, like, do you regret it? Like, do you regret enlisting? Do you regret having these ideas? Would you be more on the side? What were your motivations? You know, I think it would be much more personal about like, if you, it's that always thing, like if I could, if I could jump ahead and look back, well, what's that like for you now? Because it was so unexpected. And if you link that to the just base humanity of these people, I, I don't know, I, I would just want to know, like, it would, I can imagine being very difficult if I was doing literally everything I could, giving like the last ounce of devotion towards a certain goal to then find out it was all for naught because because I was being, I don't want to say I was being duped, but 
I believed someone that I shouldn't have believed. Um, and I think that's part of why I got emotional because I, I, I can imagine the answer and it sucks. Like the answer would probably suck. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's what I would ask. You know, I would want to know more about the personal life, but also that, that reflection on uh, here's where things went. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah uh, no, no, no. I appreciate that. Um, I guess the last question then is for those listening, could you just provide some more information about your book when it comes out and where people could uh, perhaps get a copy? Absolutely. Yeah. So it should be coming out either later this year or early next year. I'm in the final rounds of revision and the indexing, which always takes a little bit of time. Uh, it's going to come out with Cambridge University Press. So it'll be available on their website. Uh, and my hope is that we'll be able to move quickly and have it out by the end of the year. But if not, it should be out early next year. And it's not only a consideration of, uh, you know, this exact case that we were talking about, but I compare these, these four traditions and I try to, in the final sections, I tried to articulate a new understanding of martyrdom that's appropriate for all the different traditions. And I think that tells us something about what it is to be human as humans are always embedded in their societies, in the communities that they're a part of. And I think that's why martyrdom is so consistent. Um, so yeah, they'll be out later this year with Cambridge University Press. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a hot seller. You know, academic books fly off the shelves. Look at New York Times. Uh, but uh, but you, you'll find it on their website, I'm sure nice nice um i just want to double check that we've got through all of the questions that i had um written down i just want to make sure is there anything that you think we should include or anything that we've missed out that you want to just kind of mention before we wrap up no i feel like we hit on, on all the things that i wanted to talk about and i was you know there were a few things throughout that i wanted to make sure we touched upon but yeah i mean there's always like more to talk about but you know i i, I think we yeah, we have to keep with it no no for sure um in that case i can only say thank you we've been recording for oh, just under two hours um i also appreciate the fact that we're working in two different time zones so organizing it is also a lot of fun i hope you have the uh, a great day rest of your day um and i really enjoyed this man it's a lot no, of fun likewise. yeah it's great it's questions been... and yeah it's been an enjoyable conversation no thank you so much thank you thank you we'll talk to you soon take care bye take care bye bye